Now what we have here is spermiogenesis. Now spermiogenesis, again, not the same as spermatogenesis. They are different. Or well, actually, spermiogenesis is part of spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is the entire process, whereas spermiogenesis is only the very last step before you finally form sperm. So this is the final step of spermatogenesis. And this is an immature spermatid. It does have that half the number of chromosomes. It does have this final genetic material, but now it needs to grow this final structure, this tail right here. So there's no further genetic changes, no crossovers, no division. And it takes about five weeks. So even though it's the last step, it's not just a simple one five minute step. It actually takes five weeks to develop from a spermatid to a sperm. So again, this is why it's important to have these sustentacular cells, aka nurse cells, aka Sertoli cells. But these sperm take a long time to get ready. So here we have an immature spermatid, and then it goes under a spermiogenesis. This is the entire process. And then it goes, becomes a mature sperm or spermatozoon. So again, this is only the part, spermatogenesis includes the spermatogonium that we saw back in the previous slide. But now we're going from that spermatid to that final sperm. Okay, now that we have a mature sperm, let's look at the sperm's anatomy itself. Now sperm anatomy, you get, the sperm has three main parts, the head, the midpiece, and there is a neck joining the head and the midpiece. And then you have the tail. Now let's look at the clo head cl more closely. So the head has a part, this little cap around here, and this is what we call the acrosome, highlighted in red here. And what does the acrosome contain? It's actually a, a kind of like a little packet containing a lot of enzymes that help and aid in, for a sperm to deliver its nuclear genetic material into an egg. The thing about the ovum is that it actually has multiple barriers before you get to the inside of the egg and before you get fertilization. So then the thing is about that, or actually before you can get combine the genetic material of the sperm with the egg. So the acrosome helps to digest those outer protective layers of the ovum to help in deliver that genetic material. So the sperm also has a nucleus. Again, just like your nuclei and your other cells contain DNA, this is where the DNA is contained. So it's all within the head of the sperm. So this is a, like the payload. So this is what the acrosomes help to enter the ovum and what it actually wants to deliver is the nucleus into the inside of the egg. Now in the mid piece, we see this long curly cued part right here. And what these are are actually mitochondria. And what is the powerhouse of the cell? Again, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell because they generate all the ATP. So you need a lot of chemical energy to provide motility and movement. So this is what the mitochondria, there's so many over here. So there's actually all these proteins that help to, once you have all this ATP, actually moves and rotates this part right here, the tail. So the tail is actually providing motility. This is the part that whips around. That's why you might see you sperm under the microscope you go like this, but actually it's like taking something that's pretty long, and let me see if I can pull up something right here. All right, here we have a USB cord. So here I have a long structure right here. What happens if I start rotating it? Well, notice that it starts to whip around. So your, the tail of the sperm kind of works very similarly. By the mid piece providing the energy to rotate this tail, this causes the tail to whip around. This is what propels a, a sperm forward. So let's use another metaphor. So the sperm is kind of like so this is kind of how the sperm kind of works. What we have here is that in the in, inboard outboard motor, what we have here is that the propeller provides motility. So your tail whipping around, that's providing motility for a sperm. But it also needs energy. So just like they have the engine here, you have the mitochondria. This is providing the fuel. And this also has the, the mid piece also has the protein mechanics to actually rotate that tail and cause it to propel forward. So that engine. This is the mid piece. And then they have, why well, am I only showing half a kid? Well, remember the payload is only half the genetic instructions of the offspring. And then you have enzymes. So if you're using this boat like a battering ram, if you want to, this little kid, half of the kid wants to break into somewhere, he's going to ram that battering ram and ram that, that acrosome. So the acrosome is kind of like a battering ram, but on a chemical level. It helps to penetrate the outer layers of the ovum so they can finally deliver that genetic material. 
Now the thing about sperm, so the thing about sperm is that, yes, a man can generate a lot of sperm, and in typical ejaculation, there's about 250 million sperm. So that sounds like, okay, why is, do men still have fertility problems? Well, the thing is that you have all these sperm, but just only uh, just under 60% in typical ejaculate is, are alive. Let's say we're just having healthy young adult male. So only, yeah, just a little over half are alive. But the thing is that only about 40% are motile, so they can't act. So actually these right here, notice that they're not swimming. So if you don't have swimming, they're going to have a hard time actually reaching the fallopian tubes to fertilize an egg. And if they're only 40% are motile, well, the other thing is that normal sperm. So when I'm talking about normal sperm, this is what a normal sperm looks like from the side and from the anterior posterior. But the thing is that if you look at a typical sperm semen sample, well, you might find these different shapes. You may have giant sperm, sperm with two heads, sperm with two tails, or all of these deformed sperms. So normal sperm, only about 20, uh, less than a quarter of them. If you have more than a quarter, that's pretty atypical. So I think the WHO guidelines, like maybe 4 to 25% is the normal range of normal sperm in a typical semen sample. So many things can also affect, so that was just talking about normal, normal sperm, but the thing is that other things can affect sperm quality as well. So lifestyle and environmental factors, not just about the man producing sperm, but also what environment he's in, what his lifestyle is like. So things like xenobiotics, these are substances foreign to your normal metabolism. So things like alcohol, cannabinoids from marijuana or smoking byproducts, they actually all lower sperm quality. So if you have someone that a man does the excessive quality quantities of this, they might end up with fewer of the normal sperm and more sperm that looks like this or sperm that are not motile. And then stress. So another thing that can cause interfertility or fertility problems is stress. A man who is constantly stressed might be producing felt fewer motile, healthy, or normal sperm. And nutrition, vitamin and nutritional deficiency. This also affects as well. So the thing is that actually nutritional deficiency affects both male and female reproductive. So male is going to affect sperm quality and count, and females, it can also affect hormones as well and ovulation. If this, So if you're being starved or vitamin deficient or nutritionally deficient, it's typically not a good time to have a baby, right? Because again, you want that baby to have a, a uh, sufficient nutrition. So if that you have all these environmental stresses, that's probably not the time. And excessive heat. So the thing about this is that sperm, if it's you know, the testes are too warm, then this can actually cook sperm. So I mean, not like cook it like make a bath, but um, like making a soup. But the thing is that excessive heat. So this is why the testes can actually change in terms of like how close they are to the body. The thing is that these seminiferous tubules, they don't like being held at internal body temperature. This tends to cause sperm to look more deformed or it tends to kill sperm if you have too much heat. And actually there's, um, in Japan, they did a study that why were some men having fertility problems? And the thing is that in Japan, one thing they like to do is take, is take baths in what they call onsen, which are like hot springs. So there are these pools of water that are fed heated by volcanic heat and they would take baths in these hot environments well what were they doing they were causing too much heat in their testes and this was causing killing off the sperm so for these men who want to have offspring and they would tell them hey don't take these really hot baths because they might be lowering your sperm count and quality So yes, we have the scrotum, and that helps to cool off the testes so that the sperm can mature, mature in the seminiferous, or actually the sperm can develop in the seminiferous tubules and mature as well and become healthy and motile. But the thing is that how do your testes keep the optimal temperature, say it's too hot or say it's too cold? It's also, if it's also too cold, then that can also reduce sperm quality as well. So the thing is that optimal temperature is actually a little less than normal, normal body temperature. So this is again why the testes are outside the body and contained within that scrotum, right? And this is why the scrotum exists. Now there are two primary muscles that actually can move the scrotum. So two of them are dartos and premaster. Other muscles can help, but these are the two main movers.